Guru Gay, graduate, resident of Chandigarh, businessman by occupation, belonging to upper class. He is presented to us with chief complaints of fever and left flank pain for past three months. My patient is a known case of autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease who underwent live donor related renal transplant in March 2012. In Jan 2023, patient presented with history of fever for past two days. It was high grade, intermittent, associated with chills. Fever was also associated with left flank pain, which was diffuse, severe in intensity, dull aching in character, and continuous. It was not associated with any bleeding or precipitating factors. Sorry, underwent renal transplant 2012 for March. Then complaint he's having since how long? Uh, sir, three months. Three months, okay. Uh, he did not give history of any trauma, blood in urine, or burning maturation at that time. There was no history of uh, gravel urea or decreased urine output. There was no history of enzyme intake at that time. He consulted his nephrologist and was started on oral antibiotics uh, uh, and was given Aldraset for pain relief. Investigation at that time revealed normal leukocyte count and serum creatinine of 3 mg per deciliter. Uh, there was no uh, blood or urine cultures that were sent at that time. He responded to treatment, fever and pain settled and he continued his antibiotics for 5 days. Patient continued to experience generalized weakness even after this episode. He complained of lethargy, decreased appetite and easy fatigability. He, he persisted to have uh, continue with these symptoms for next 2 months. He again started complaining of fever since last 10 days. It was high grade, 102 to 103 degree Fahrenheit which was documented, intermittent, associated with drivers and chills. Fever was associated again with left flank pain. It was severe in intensity, dull aching in character and diffuse. It was again not associated with any issue of trauma or blood in urine. There was no issue of burning maturation, decreased urine output. There was no issue of lower urinary tract symptoms. There was no issue of gravel urea. There was no issue of redness or rash on overlying skin. He was admitted at a local hospital in ICU and on admission he was told to have low blood pressure. He, uh, there he was found to have a hemoglobin of 10.4 with raised leukocyte count of 13,000 and serum creatinine of 4.4 mg per deciliter. He was managed with IV antibiotics and tramadol injection and his microfinorate was stopped. He also underwent CT abdomen there, which revealed bilateral and large kidney, which he remembered to be about 25-26 cm and was also informed that his left kidney had, had a ruptured uh, cyst. His blood and urine cultures done in that hospital did not show any uh, uh, growth. But his pain persisted and his serum creatinine increased to 5.6 mg per deciliter. He then presented to our hospital for further evaluation and management. Uh, the course in our hospital, he was managed conservatively uh, with IV antibiotics and bed rest and also given ultrasound for pain relief. He responded to treatment, became afibrile in 48 hours and pain improved. His creatinine also showed declining trend as, he, as it was informed to uh, him by his doctor. He was now being planned for left nephrectomy. Sir, I would like to continue in my past history. Yes. Uh, my, in past history, my patient is a known case of... Transplant was done in right in the Yes, I am uh, Patient is a known case of autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease since 2002 and a known case of hypertension for past 20-25 years uh, around the same time when he first found out he had kidney disease. He was on regular follow-up since then and gradually progressed to end-stage renal disease over the next 9-10 to 10 years. He went ahead with preemptive uh, ABO compatible live donor related transplant on 19th of March 2012 with mother and donor and received Similac in uh, induction uh, and was put on triple immunosuppression in the form of tacrolimus, mycophenolate, and steroid. His nadir creatinine post transplant was 1.5 mg per deciliter on his chart. He was on regular follow up and compliance uh, to his medication during his post transplant period. His post-transplant period was otherwise uneventful. There was no history of infection which required hospitalization. His creatinine remained stable between 1.4 to 1.7 mg per deciliter. In 2017, he was detected to have diabetes and was started on insulin. 
he had been compliant to the same and told that he had good uh, blood sugar control with the treatment. In fact, uh, his graft function remained stable in the meantime. In February 2022, patient was detected to have a rise in serum creatinine that is 2.2 mg per deciliter on routine follow-up. There was no issue of fever, vomiting or diarrhea. There was no issue of non-compliance or non-adherence regarding immunosuppression or change in immunosuppression. Uh, he underwent graft kidney biopsy in March 2022. He was informed that he had 40 to 50 percent chronic changes in his graft biopsy and was continued on same treatment. His creatinine continued to remain between 2.2 to 2.5 mg per deciliter over the next few months. In November 2022, he presented uh, with history of dyspnea on exertion and chest discomfort for a month. There was no history of uh, swelling of feet or decreased urine output and his creatinine at that time was 2.8 mg per deciliter. He underwent coronary angiography and was told that it was normal. Post angiography, there was no history of worsening of renal function. This is regarding my past history. Uh, in personal history, he is a married man since 1998 with two children, a 20 year old uh, uh, daughter and a 13 year old son. He is an occasional alcohol intake, he is non smoker, consumes a mixed diet. He's Otherwise, has normal bowel and bladder habits and there is normal sleep pattern. Uh, in family history, um, his grandfather died at the age of 77 years of age uh, and was told that he had kidney failure but there was no definite cause and neither had he ever gone, uh, uh, undergone any dialysis. Other than that, uh, there is no history of uh, uh, known kidney disease in family. There is no history of any early unexplained death in the family and there is no history of stroke in the family. Uh, in surgical history, he was opera uh, operated, uh, he underwent laparoscopic polycystectomy in Feb 2013 and underwent uh, surgery for uh, umbilical hernia in 2014. <laughs> <laughs> Parents, you said there was no history, family history. No, sir. Uh, his uh, father died at the age. Yeah. His father, his mother is still alive and doing well. Father died at the age of 87 years of uh, age, and uh, they said that uh, likely it was uh, natural causes. He has uh, two other siblings. The eldest one is seven years old, uh, elder to him, and second middle one is five years older to him, and they both are doing well. No such uh, history of uh, kidney disease. In the family. Yes. And children, have they been screened so much? Uh, sir, his daughter has undergone ultrasound uh, because of some uh, medical examination and all, but he, they were told that it is normal. How old is he? 20. 20 years. And the son has not no. been investigated. No. So, what do you think you're dealing with? Uh, sir, according to history, this is uh, a case of uh, uh, post uh, live donor related renal transplant uh, uh, with basic disease uh, being autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, hypertension, diabetes uh, with acute on chronic graft dysfunction. Mm -hmm. The acute factor likely being sepsis. I would uh, go ahead and uh, think that most likely the uh, you, uh, reason for sepsis being cyst infection or native kidney palliative. Why are you saying sepsis? He had history of, uh, uh, he had worsening of his uh, renal function, he had history of low blood pressure when he was admitted outside. Uh, raised TNC. So this last 10 days when he had recurrence of fever and left side flank pain, his blood pressure was on the lower side. Lower so side. When he was admitted there, he had. So that was <coughs> part of my part. In. So what is the definition of sepsis? When you say, why any infection is not sepsis? Or say septicemia or septic shock. Uh, sepsis would be um, uh, with uh, hemodynamic uh, uh, instability, associated with hemodynamic instability, uh, but uh, respond uh, fluid responses. Just 
responsive or non-responsive, that doesn't matter. I mean, even if it, he has hemodynamic stability and severe sepsis, septic shock, he may not respond to fluids. It's not necessary that it should be fluid responsive. The one is evidence of infection. Evidence of infection. Plus hypotension or hemodynamic instability, as you said, or sometimes high lactate, lactate more than two. So that again would be evidence of hypoperfusion or hemodynamic instability. At times they may not have frank hypotension, but if there is hypoperfusion, they will have high lactate level, and that will again indicate that these patients have hypoperfusion. So we don't know as except for that one reading of low blood pressure when he was admitted to a hospital 10 days ago, there was no evidence. He has been taking treatment from various places for last three months. So what is this going on for three months? Uh, I would uh, uh, candidate uh, fever, hybrid fever, chills yeah. also. So infection is another possibility. Other than that, uh, cyst hemorrhage can be there as well. Okay. Uh, then uh, cyst structure as so why would anybody will develop fever because of that? See, if there is cyst hemorrhage or cyst rupture, that might give rise to pain in that area, but that will not cause evidence of infection or fever. So since the patient is presenting complaint was fever, fever definitely there was infection. infection. Okay. There may be different reasons for this infection. It may be just a lower urinary tract infection, right? Or it may be some other infection like lung infection or anything, but since there is a localization to his left kidney, which you know that it is a polycystic kidney disease, so by common sense you will assume that there probably there is uh, infection or left side pain body. and high grade fever, so it's unlikely to be just a lower unit tract infection, it has to be pyelonephritis, and since he has pain in the left side, so left side is pyelonephritis or cyst infection is the primary reason for his presentation. So if you are treating this patient say three months ago, how would you treat this patient? Uh, sir, cyst infections are uh, uh, usually they are, they are difficult to treat, so I would uh, uh, longer duration of, I would have given him longer duration of antibiotics rather than just five days of treatment. Okay. What else? Then uh, his, uh, uh, if his, uh, 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 this infection was not setting and he was persistently complaining of pain and uh, 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 other features like a low grade fever also, I would have liked to reduce his immunosuppression uh, uh, okay. and uh, uh, mainly bed rest and uh, supportive care analysis. Choice of antibiotics? Sir, in this we uh, give lipid soluble antibiotics, uh, especially which can uh, penetrate the cyst wall. Uh, mm -hmm. The choice being chlorophenolone, uh, trimethoprim, cotrimoxifu, as a drug of choice. Just these two? Mainly. Usually there is widespread five. resistance to these organs, mm -hmm. these medicines, like cotrimoxifu are so commonly used, usually available in oral form. So, in patients who have severe infection, like your patient, with immunocompromised. I don't think this giving the full time exercise will be reasonable yes. or good enough. Uh, Other you said chlorophenolone. Again, there is a lot of resistance to chlorophenolone. What other antibiotics can be given? Carbapenem, Neuropenem. Carbapenem, yes. Anything else? And? <coughs> which we don't use now. So if you have all these antibiotics in your armamentarium, as I said, uh, Teptran or Cotrimexazole, usually oral antibiotic, not good for patients who have severe infection. There is widespread resistance to phenolones, especially chlorophenolones. Chlorophenicol anyway is not our favorite drug. So that will leave us with Cephalosporin and Carbapenem. And Looking at the bacteriological spectrum now, there are many cephalosporin resistant gram negative bacteria, right? So, 
but still i would agree one can choose between these two antibodies either you will use injectable uh, or cephalosporin will cover these organisms and you will definitely give it for a longer period of time assuming that this will be a test infection so just that his fever subsided in 5 to 10 days will not be sufficient So you think this rise in creatinine is to three milligram? Was this a rise or? There was a rise. We definitely uh, had our biopsy proven uh, graph uh, dysfunction and chronicity. And uh, up till November, his creatinine was stable, still two point eight. Uh, but after that, since the first episode, it went up to three, and then again when he presented to us, it went up to four point five, five point six. Three months it was four point five and six. Five point two. Yeah, just this is a patient, post-transplant patient. You are you are given history. My basic question when came to you, suppose you are seeing the patient, how you will approach this patient? A transplant patient having developed post-transplant diabetes, getting infection. You know, what is the common source of getting infection in any patient? From where you will get the infection in post-transplant? Uh, infection, even if it is asymptomatic bacteria, there are very high chances of retrograde seeding and infection in these patients. How you will approach? How you will approach this patient? What test you will do first, second, third? How will what sir is asking? How will make the diagnosis that the ATP get is cysty infected? Uh, sir, first of all, <laughs> first of all, uh, the basic exam, uh, basic investigations that we uh, we go to uh, like uh, complete hemogram. Then, uh, including CBC, TLC, neutrophil counts, mm-hmm. uh, platelet counts, uh, we can then his renal definitely his renal function, uh, urea, creatinine, sodium, potassium uh, needs to be seen. Uh, polycystic kidney disease, uh, even though uh, very less chances of liver involvement, but if a patient is coming to us in sepsis, there can be liver dysfunction because of severe sepsis. Uh, urine routine definitely and blood and urine cultures. Uh, so what, 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 what do you will expect in urine examination in this patient? Uh, sir, in urine examination, uh, uh, there. Uh, very important test. Yes, sir. Hmm? Uh, there, uh, I, I will be expecting uh, if if it is retrograde seeding, then I'll be expecting bacteria and uh, pyuria. So suppose you do a urine examination and there's no pustules in the urine. Yeah. Still, I would like to keep my uh, diagnosis uh, this as a uh, cyst uh, infection only because uh, not necessarily it is always present and be hematogenous. It it may be hematogenous. Mm-hmm. Most of these cysts they uh, do not communicate with urinary tract. So as you said, ascending infection that may be one more, but usually it's not. Hematogenous. Okay, most of these patients who have cyst infection they do not have those urinary symptoms, or you may not find pustules in the urine. So that does not exclude cyst infection, right? So, but you will definitely do a urine examination and urine culture to see whether he has associated low urine tract infection. Uh, what important past history we ask in this patient before transplantation? You can ask. In the case of ADP, ADP. Regarding this diagnosis, recurrent left flank pain. What past history you will ask? Hematuria. Hematuria. Any other history? Uh, Gravity urea. Any history of stones? Stones in the family? Uh, no, there is no history. Nothing not there. Sure, but he said that there was no such history in the family. So, now, <coughs> as I said, you were treating this patient three months ago. He came to you for the first time. Then you probably suspect this infection. Start him on antibiotics, a propane antibiotics. And how will you make a diagnosis whether he has this infection? He doesn't have it. So normally, uh, cyst infection are d- difficult to uh, mainly we go uh, we just connect the clinical scenario with the investigation because it is difficult to uh, have a confirmatory diagnosis uh, because cyst infection How is usually will you do not. That? What will you do for confirmation? Yes. Cyst uh, aspiration if it is uh, amenable and if it is if the stage cannot go ahead with that then there are immune so tables and cyst, labels. Which cyst will you aspirate? So he has thousands of cysts. As you said, his kidney size was 20 to 25 centimeters. Millions of cysts in one kidney. So which cyst will you aspirate? So usually aspiration. Have you seen aspiration? You are in third year now. Have you seen aspiration being done? Not yet. Then, then why, why, why do you say that you will? You must have seen a lot of patients who have polycystic kidney disease and came with such infection. 
So if it is not, was not done, that means that's not the routine thing to do. Right? So what else can you do? Other than that, uh, uh, imaging. What uh, imaging? What imaging? Uh, what imaging? Uh, MRI and CT can give us an idea, uh, so but not definite. Of, what type of CT? Uh, sir, usually we prefer uh, contrast enhanced CT. Contrast enhanced CT. So, and this patient is post kidney transplant is and it's creatinine in oh. three. Really not good. So good. you are worried about his kidney function. Right. So you will not want to give a contrast. Right. right. If you do a plain CT, will you be able to pick up? No, sir. There is, uh, we can only pick up on stool if there is any stone or calcification, but we will not be able yeah. to. So the, our aim to see whether there is pus or not. So this CT, plain CT will not differentiate whether there is blood or pus or fluid. Am I right? MRI also, it will not exactly differentiate between infected or hemorrhagic, what type of fluid is it? It can it's be sterilized. Unless and then you do a contrast MRI and find out the inflammation around the cyst, right? right? Again, this patient has high creatinine. So, would you do a contrast MRI? Uh, usually, nowadays, the drugs which are used in MRI are considered to be nephrosafe. safe. So, we do sometimes go ahead with contrast enhanced. What MRI. drug do you use? Uh, the, is some uh, uh, low osmolar uh, okay. gadolinium. Gadolinium is this uh, MRA contrast. There is no osmolar anti low osmolar or high osmolar. So, what is the problem with gadolinium in renal failure? Uh, it causes uh, uh, five, uh, five, uh, five, uh, five, uh, five. Sorry, eight and a bullet. Sub no, The nephrogenic system of Apple. Yes. What is it? Sir, uh, uh, gadolinium toxicity, because of uh, gadolinium, it causes interstitial fibrosis. Interstitial fibrosis. Sir, fibrosis. So, what is the manifestation? How, how will you know that the patient has developed this? Sir, rise in serum creatinine or decrease in serum Rise in serum creatinine. Yeah. Next, you don't know it. That was fibrosis. Right? Yes. So, how, how will it present? Sir, usually thickened skin and uh, the skin is totally tight and it usually presents uh, after a year or so. Yes, so that is the remote toxicity. So you give a gadolinium now, maybe one, okay. two, three years or maybe ten years yeah. down the line, patient can develop this skin changes, okay. uh, dermal changes. So that is the concern. But if there is a life and death situation, you so never know whether patient is going to live for next ten years or not. You can do a contrast. MRI in this point of time. So not hundred percent diagnosis, but you can do in such situation WBC type test. Uh, in the So that is one way. Other thing is even contrast now, contrast CT scan. People say if you take precautions and you give a low dose yeah. contrast or they as you said non non ionic iso isotonic contrast, that can also be done in such situation. What else imaging? What other imaging you can do? You don't want to do contrast, you don't want to do MRI. One doctor thing has suggested you can do yeah, so radionucleotide scan. So WBC tagged with radionucleotide and they will home into the area where there is inflammation. So that, that area will lit up. Right? So you will know okay which side and which cyst is infected and then you can plan your treatment for the body. Any what else? What else has uh, come the, now? Uh, there are uh, people do use FDG PET also, yes. but that yes. is more uh, that evidence has shown that it is not very useful for liver, uh, kidney cysts, rather it is much more helpful with liver cysts, infected liver cysts. Why, why not kidney? Why not? You can get an idea at least uh, yes. to locate the kidney. Why not kidney cysts? And that you can use in this. Uh, how, in how, does, in how, how does that help? What happens? What is the physiology behind that? Maybe? Um, how does it lit up malignancy? Uh, increase the high metabolic. Uh, so what is this FD? Uh, what type of substrate? So what type of substrate is this? Glucose. Glucose. Mm -hmm. Right. So the cells which are highly metabolically active, which are generally cancerous cells or infected cells, right? So there is a high metabolism and they will take up this glucose, which is labeled with this chlorine. And that will show up. The same thing which happens in malignancy. So wherever there are malignant cells with high metabolic activity, it will lit up. Same way, 
they, wherever there is infection, high metabolic activity, it will do. So it will localize to kidney and you will know okay which side of kidney is infected. This patient has a localizing feature like say left side kidney pain mm -hmm. number. Right. At times you may get patients who just have fever and no localization. So you are not sure which kidney is infected, whether you can go with a right nephrectomy or a left nephrectomy or both nephrectomy. So these tests will help you to take that decision. So you will give, choose the antibiotic accordingly, which will penetrate the cell. Give these antibiotics for a longer period of time to eradicate the infection. Monitor these patients. If the patient does not get better, try to localize the infection. And if required, either you can deroute the cyst. If this is superficial cyst, you can deroute and do a partial or local type of cutting. But since native kidneys are no longer important in such patients, you can, you can directly go for a nephrectomy, whichever cyst is involved. Other thing which you said in history was he got an ultrasound and they said ruptured cyst. CT cyst. CT abdomen was pronounced there. So what was the evidence of rupture? How do you diagnose rupture cyst on CT? What did you see? You saw that? No, thing? sir. He just said since he Did was, you see the CT? No. No. Okay. He just gave the history that okay. um, So so you don't know what was the finding? Yes. Okay. So again the ruptured cyst will not give rise to fever and evidence of sepsis which this patient has. Rupture cyst may just give you a perirenal hematoma or some collection around the kidney. So that was that in history. Okay, go ahead. Examination. Examination. Uh, patient was conscious, cooperative, oriented, so time, place, and person. He was lying comfortably on bed. His uh, height, uh, he, uh, he had a BMI. BMI of 30.5 kg per meter square. Uh, pulse of 92 per minute, regular, normal volume, no radial radial or radio femoral delay. All peripheral pulses were present. Uh, his right upper limb blood pressure was 142 by 100 in supine position, and left upper limb had 142 by 98 uh, millimeters of mercury in supine position. On standing, blood pressure was 144 by 102. Right lower limb blood pressure was 154 by 100 and left lower limb was 154 by 102 millimeters of mercury. Respiratory rate of 18. Why did you measure blood pressure in all four limbs? Uh, sir, in 25% uh, of the uh, cases, there is uh, uh, in ADPKD, there is cardiac involvement too. And uh, uh, sometimes they also have a uh, regurgitation. In, that, in those patients, there might be discrepancy in lower limb and upper limb uh, blood pressure. Discrepancy? Uh, I mean, higher blood pressure, more systolic blood pressure, more than uh, 20. What What type of heart abnormality do you see in patients with inhibition? Most commonly, it's uh, mitral valve prolapse. Mitral valve prolapse, or it may lead to mitral valve regurgitation. Mm -hmm. So, how common is aortic regurgitation? Why does it occur? In general, in aortic regurgitation can occur in any other patient who has been a failure for example. What is the mechanism? Why? Commonest reason why do they develop regurgitation? Aortic root dilatation. Root dilatation because of long standing hypertension in these patients. So these patients. So what type of blood pressure you will get in aortic regurgitation? Uh, water hammer. Water hammer water pulse hammer. or wide pulse, pulse pressure. pressure. Right. So do you see the discrepancy in upper limb and lower limb? If you measure the blood pressure, how did you measure blood pressure in the lower limb? Sir, so, uh, I used a uh, thigh cup and I thought in uh, popliteal uh, foot. So which cup did you tie? Uh, sir, 16 into 40 cents. Large size cup. Large size. You, you had that available? Yes, we have to ask for it. Sir. You, you get it. Okay. So, if you examine blood pressure in the high, say, hand and leg, so which you, what is the difference? Normally, it should be, uh, uh, normally, lower limb has a uh, high uh, blood pressure about 10 to 12 millimeters of mercury more than upper limb. Why? Uh, 
Why the blood pressure is higher in the lower limbs? Sorry? Thickened vessels. So, vessels will get thickened in the leg, not in the hand. Speak loudly, I can't hear you. You don't know. So what will happen? So relatively smaller cup size for the leg. So you can use the same hand cup. Mm. Sorry? It is using the uh, smaller uh, cup size as compared to the uh, thigh. Uh, Length of the thigh. Then so it will be a falsely high reading. Falsely high reading. As you get in an obese patient. In a patient who are very obese and you use a smaller size cup, it will give a falsely high blood pressure reading. And that's the reason you get falsely high blood pressure reading in the leg. Right? Good. That is the reason. Otherwise, if you measure the intra arterial pressure, it will be the same in upper limb and lower limb. So, it's just a method of measuring blood pressure which will make a difference. What See, if you are not as expecting difference in blood pressure, say you are not seeing a patient who has auto arthritis or who has patient of aorta or any such thing, it's not necessary that you always measure blood pressure in all cases. What are the other systems involved in examination, in edification? Examination for a new one. Most commonly, liver is involved in up to 94% of the patients. Like, you you complete your examination. Okay. Complete your examination. The respiratory rate of 18 per minute it was regular. Uh, uh, temperature of 97.2 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, seen in uh, axillary region. In general, physical, there was pallor present, no strip. Oral cavity was uh, healthy, normal dentition, JVC was not raised, no apparent lymphadenopathy, uh, normal, no edema, no normal hernia size. On examination, per abdominal examination, on inspection, abdomen was distended, plants were full, there was no visible pulsation, no dilated vein, all quadrants were moving equally with respiration. There was an oblique linear heat scar seen in uh, lo uh, right lower quadrant. Uh, and, uh, uh, and two small scars seen in supraamblical and epigastric region. On uh, palpation, <coughs> on superficial palpation, the temperature was not raised on any quadrant. Uh, there was uh, no graft site tenderness. Uh, there was diffuse tenderness uh, uh, present in left upper uh, and uh, left uh, lower quadrant. Uh, on deep palpation, the liver was palpable 2 cm below the posterior margin and I could only feel the rounded uh, border. Um, he being an obese patient, I could not uh, appreciate the graft kidney much. Uh, bilateral kidneys were enlarged, right kidney was balotable, and I felt a uh, rough surface, but uh, since he had tenderness on the uh, left, uh, 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 then uh, uh, on percussion, uh, there was some panic nose heard and auscultation, bowel sounds were normal. Uh, on cardiovascular uh, examination, on inspection, the precordium was normal. Apex pulse was seen in fifth intercostal space. There was no dilated veins, no scar mark, no abnormal pulsation seen. On palpation, uh, apex peak was seen in fifth intercostal space, just medial to midclavicular line. There were uh, uh, no abnormal uh, pulsations felt in any other region. Uh, on auscultation, uh, uh, I could uh, uh, regular heart rate, S1, S2 were audible and there were no murmurs heard. Uh, in respiratory system. Uh, Anything abnormal? No. If it is normal, then you can pass it on as unremarkable. Uh, respiratory system was unremarkable and in, in neurological sy uh, system, there was no focal neurological deficit found. So, basically, what do we have now? Uh, mainly. Bilateral and large kidneys, uh, uh, graft kidney in uh, right iliac right fossa, along with uh, tenderness, uh, diffuse tenderness in left half of the abdomen. And TNG as well as posterior. Mainly and TJV, sir. Have you seen the renal entanglement? Sir, he was too apprehensive to let me touch his own thing. But he was lying so fine comfortably. Okay. 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 So, but there was like significant tenderness in yes, the left half, so he, he did not, not even allow him to palpate it properly. Yeah. Good. So, what do you think now after? I would still like to continue with the same uh, 
So with all that background, now you think that he probably had left-sided infection, chest infection, which has been going on for the last three months, inadequately treated, yeah. and now he has presented this severe infection, and fever, septic, and with grafted from. So again, the question is in any way. It's the same, uh, same choice of antibiotic. Either respond and then the plan for a definitive yeah. treatment in the form of yeah. Now, coming to this, what Dr. K. and Singh had asked. So, in patients who have polycystic kidney disease, what other organ involvement do you see? Uh, so, the most common other organ, uh, other organ that is involved is liver. Now, in, uh, up to, uh, by the age of 40 to 45 years, up to 94% of the patients have liver cysts. Other than that, uh, um, uh, uh, Twenty-five percent of the patients have cardiac involvement. Um, then, uh, in uh, vascular involvement, intracranial aneurysm uh, uh, can be found. Uh, can be found. Uh, uh, then there can be uh, thoracic aortic dissection. There can be cervicopathic uh, uh, artery dissection that can be seen in vascular uh, 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 involvement. Then. Uh, 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 colonic diverticulitis uh, and diverticulosis, uh, then uh, hernia is a common such patient. Uh, uh, other than that, uh, uh, there can be cysts which can be seen, arachnoid cysts can be seen uh, in up to 5%, pancreatic cysts can be seen up to 2%, uh, spinal mani uh, meningeal cysts can be present. Uh, then uh, in up to 40% of the patients, a manual with alcohol uh, cysts uh, cyst are so you can see cysts in different organs, commonest mm -hmm. is liver, mm -hmm. but you can also see in pancreas, mm -hmm. seminal vesicles, mm -hmm. sometimes in agnoid, spinal meningitis. And other thing which is important and clinically significant is aneurysm. Mm -hmm. So how common are aneurysms? Sir, in uh, patients with a positive family history, it is common in up to 16% of the patients, but it, with negative history, uh, negative family history, it can be seen in up to 6% of the patients. Usually around 10% patients mm -hmm. may have aneurysm, more is that family history and the lesser with the patients who do not have a family yeah. history. Size of cysts, what is important? Mm -hmm. uh, sir, in, uh, uh, if it is less than 5, uh, then uh, uh, we mainly have, and there is no positive family history. Uh, no, if there is a positive family history less than 5, we evaluate, uh, we can... That is, we will come to the diagnosis, how do you make the diagnosis? So in this patient, for example, this is a patient, now he is 50 years and he has undergone a kidney transplant 10 years ago. By age of, at the age of 40 years, he has end-stage kidney disease with cyst in both the kidneys in large kidneys. What type of polycystic kidney disease do you think this patient has? He seems to be a rapid progressor, sir. Uh, okay. So now, since he does not have any... Uh, I would think that this uh, PKD1 mutation likely and more likely from taking mutation. You said he did not have any family history. So you think that the mutation has happened for the first time, which has manifested? The process of the patient can be de novo. So he is sent this way. So maybe up to 25% patient who may not get family history, and this may be the first case. He did not have any system in the liver, no system in the liver. Yes, liver system. So, what else can you do to make the diagnosis of polycystic kidney disease? For example, if you see this patient in 2002, when he came to you with hypertension and you find that there are cysts in the liver, no family history. So, before you label this patient as ADP kidney. Uh, it, this at that time he was less than 45 years old. Uh, if we follow the era EDP uh, criteria, uh, if if uh, his uh, uh, in less than 45 years of age, if his kidney size is more than 16.5 centimeters, uh, then we can say that. Then we can use the Mayo uh, clean, uh, clean classification uh, um, for the uh, diagnosis. Uh, it's not for diagnosis, right? No, Mayo Clinic classification is yes, for treatment. Pre prognosis. prognosis of the patient. Right. So, for diagnosis? USG. Then ultrasound, uh, imaging can be done. Uh, then, uh, other than that, uh, then study can So, how do you decide about with imaging? Uh, we have the Revine 5 
classification for the ultra uh, for ultrasound or ultrasonographic uh, diagnosis of autosomal polycystic kidney disease from in 15 to uh, 29 years of age um, uh, if uh, the patient has uh, two or more uh, cysts in uh, one or uh, more kidneys uh, the, uh, from uh, in uh, that, that classification is basically for the screening mm -hmm. screening right patients who have who do not present to you with polycystic kidney disease and you want to screen these patients whether they have polycystic kidney disease or not so if we are looking at patients where the index case is polycystic kidney disease 1 for example we do an ultrasound in their siblings or children and we see how many cysts are there at what age and whether they are possibly having this polycystic kidney disease or not if the patient will come to you with hypertension and kidney cysts and kidney kidney right so one whether the kidneys are enlarged or not say at times you may get cysts in kidneys which are otherwise damaged patients with chronic kidney disease and then they develop cysts which we call acquired cystic disease because usually they are irregular or a small kidney with some cysts right but if the kidneys are enlarged with cysts which are bilaterally bilateral symmetrically distributed that goes more in favor of polycystic kidney disease and as you said, if there are cysts in other organs as well, if the patient yes. also has liver cysts or yes. other pancreatic cysts, ovarian cysts, then it again goes in favor of yes. the genetic defect and autosomal yes. dominant polycystic yes. Right? If you do not have such thing, then you can go for genetic yes. testing and see what type of gene mutation or whether they have gene mutation or not. Suppose that there is a 20 year old king. Why not it's a medullary sponge kidney? So medullary sponge kidney uh, usually uh, they uh, present with uh, uh, there are higher chances of uh, nephrotic calcis, nephrocalcinosis and they do not uh, develop end stage renal disease uh, so early. Uh, it is uh, very, uh, very, uh, after 60 years or Usually don't, unless until they were neglecting the stones the and they need to pile and pile the size of the very kidney is very important. And the distribution, distribution of this. Yeah, the cystic kidney is just a cystic, cystic type of dilatation in the middle, right? right. not in the cortex. So the distribution of cysts is important. What are the early manifestations you will get in out of KDPKD? That means before patient landed to the Endostage renal disease, what is the first symptoms you will get? Uh, first of all, he will develop urinary concentra concentration yeah. defect. He has polyuria, polydipsia, nocturia. He will have those complaints. He might have on and off hematuria also. Hypertension presents much more earlier than uh, in, uh, in can, uh, uh, the uh, 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 presenting feature to us before he, he, he is able to. what age do they develop hypertension? So they develop hypertension at least uh, 10 to 15 years prior to the general population. So when does the general population develop hypertension? <laughs> uh, by uh, 30 years they do develop hypertension. Well, I mean around the, the natural history, if you know that somebody who has a gene for polycystic kidney disease, they will born, when they are born, they are not many cysts or the cysts are there, they are very microscopic or very small cysts. And they will continue to enlarge. So, after puberty, say at the age of say 17, 18 years or 20 years, these patients will have relatively higher blood pressure as compared to their peers. Right? And some patients may qualify for hypertension even at that age. So, as you very rightly said, so this is at least 10 years earlier than general population. Yes. The general population will have blood pressure by the age of 30 to 40 years. This patient might become hypertensive by the age of 20 to 30 years. Right? And as the cyst will grow, they will gradually lose their kidney function and they will present with various different degrees of kidney dysfunction. So, okay. so, what are the factors which are responsible for the progression of the chronic kidney disease in ADPKD? One is hypertension. Another. So how will you describe how you will this describe. patient? You have seen this patient in 2002 when he came to you with blood pressure and you find that patient has kidney. 
Uh, doctor tell me what will happen to me. Am I going to live?
So these are the patients who will have poor outcome of drag and throat muscle exposure. So the important thing is one is the hypertension, second you monitor the progression of the disease. What anti hypertension you prefer to treat with this patient? Uh, sir, uh, hypertension management is very important to retard the progression of ADP KD. Yes. In these patients, the anti hypertension of choice is uh, uh, an uh, ACE inhibitors or ARB. Why? Uh, sir, uh, Anybody? Anybody? Mechanism of hypertension is RAS activation. RAS activation is called as RAS inhibition. That is the drug asteroid. What will RAS activation do? You are causing potentation, so you will increase the risk. So, sorry? It will cause causing water retention. So, it will take to edema and pulmonary edema. What is hypertension? How will hypertension lead to rapid deterioration of kidney function? Yes. Why is it important to control blood pressure? So because there is the arteriosal, uh, afferent arteriosal. Yeah, afferent, efferent, efferent, efferent. There will be increased intraglomerular pressure because of afferent arteriosal dilatation and efferent arteriosal vasoconstriction. Very good. So, it will yeah, lead to different <laughs> arterial constriction and in patients who are, have renal failure, say, just imagine that there are 100 glomeruli, of these 100 glomeruli, 50 are knocked out, rest 50 will try to do the work for the remaining 50, so they will do hyperfiltration. So, intraglomerular so nephron glomerular filtration rate will be high. high. And how do the kidney or say glomeruli increase the filtration rate? By increasing the filtration pressure, pressure. which correlates with intraglomerular pressure, pressure, as you were saying, glomerular capillary pressure or intraglomerular pressure. So, how will you increase the pressure inside the glomeruli? You and constrict the outflow of the blood, which is efferent arterial, and you dilate the afferent arterial, which will allow more blood to flow in, and that will increase the pressure here in the glomeruli, right? And that in the long run is detrimental for the kidneys. Right? So if you want to decrease the intraglomerular pressure or capillary pressure, glomerular capillary pressure, to dilate the afferent arterial, yes. constrict the efferent arterial, mm -hmm. afferent arterial, and that will reduce the intra, reduce the intra, intra capillary or say mm -hmm. glomerular mm -hmm. capillary mm -hmm. pressure. Drug of choice. So that's why RAS, RAS mm -hmm. blocking is the drug of choice. How many nephrons in one kidney you will get? Usually. One by two. Huh? One by Anyone? One million. 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 One so one, you will control the blood pressure. So we have come to the management of these patients. What else will you do? Yeah. Sir, first of all, uh, lifestyle management, uh, especially in this patient, diabetes, sir, he already has diabetes, hypertension, so hypertension. So what type of diabetes did he have? Does he have? Oh, hmm. He did develop, but it, it occurred many years. He is obese also. So that can be, a pro it can be, uh, can be post-transplant diabetes mellitus or it can be to type 2 diabetes mellitus. Type 2 diabetes mellitus. Mellitus. So you have to control his diabetes. Uh, other than that, uh, salt restricted diet, less than 2 grams. Yeah, so next is basic question. There is defect in urine, urinary concentration <laughs> glucose. How you will measure a specific gravity? Tell us something about a specific gravity to everyone. Yeah. What is the importance of a specific gravity in the management of this IDP? So, what is the specific gravity? What is the specific gravity? Dipstick is the exact same. Dipstick is the exact same. Dipstick is the exact same. Spectrometer is the exact same. Concentration is the exact same. So, I think it's urea, especially in such patients. All the patients with kidney failure have ISO. In urea. Normal kidney is the same. Range is the same. The osmolarity is the same. What is the osmolarity? 
कोई फोर लीटर यूरिन पी ये वाटर पी गया किसी ने एक लीटर पिया कोई अंतर तो नहीं इसकी ऑस्मोलैटी नहीं है दोनों नॉर्मल है बताने दो दोस्तों हां वेरी फ्रॉम वेट व्हाट ही वाज एस्किंग बिटवीन व्हाट सो यू से वेरी देयर इज अ रेंज रेंज बट व्हाट इज द मिनिमम एंड व्हाट इज द मैक्सिमम 0000 दिस इज स्पेसिफिक रेट इट टॉक अबाउट ऑस्मोलैटी रेट ऑस्मोलैटी ओ हां 52 300 ट्रीटमेंट
So when you restrict the thought, what is? So then. Blood pressure control and other next Diabetes, treatment. Diabetes, uh, you will control in the patient. What is? Then uh, we do receptor mental release candidates. Yeah. So he is likely not out diabetes, now. No, he is not a likely now. But you were saying initially they told me which patient is a candidate for retro receptor and. So, younger patients 18 to 55 years, whom EGFR is more than 60, uh, they are, and uh, belonging to 1C to 1E male classification, they are good candidates. So, 1C to 1E, one one. or if you do not have that longitudinal follow up, you can't assess their growth rate if they have a large kidney. Yeah, large kidney. So, baseline so volume, kidney volume is more than 750 centimeters or more than 16 centimeters kidney. Yeah, younger patients with a preserved GFR, obviously. The GFR should not be less than 30, 25 or 30. So, so these are the candidates where you can use. Uh, 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 what do they work? Uh. So uh, they are retro receptor antagonists, and uh, uh, reduplexin uh, has been found to increase uh, cyst proliferation and uh, six. Uh, oh. How do how does vasopressin increase cystogenesis? Um, so mainly the cyst, uh, even though uh, the cyst can develop from any part of the nephron, but mainly they are developed from collecting duct and distal kidneys. Mm. And like, um, mm. They can develop from any part. Sir. And part, okay. uh, the so, collecting uh, followed by proximal is. Uh, CEMP generation increase karega, CEMP, AMP. Uh, cycling cycling AMP, AMP uh, generation increase karega, which will cause activation of protein kinase A, A which will then further cause activation of uh, DFTR channels and that causes uh, uh, chloride secretion, fluid uh, secretion and uh, the fluid secretion as well as proliferation and of the cells and that will lead to enlargement, cystogenesis. So once you block this pathway by giving these receptor blockers, the you will block the and, uh, progression. Is there an evidence to show that this works? Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, the, yes, sir. What uh, is the tempo 3 to 4 trial. What did that do? Uh, sir, in tempo 3 to uh, 4 trial, they found that uh, the patients who were on tall vaccine they had a decrease in uh, total kidney, uh, hypothesis total kidney uh, volume. Uh, those who were receiving tolvaptin, they had an uh, increase of 2.8% uh, compared to 5.5% in the placebo group. That is about a 40% uh, less, less growth. growth. There is no decrease placebo. in total kidney volume? There the were, growth, growth rate, rate was, was slower. slower. In patients who receive tolvaptan as compared to patients who receive placebo. A similar type of study was also Reprise. done in the US, Reprise Reprise study, study. that again showed the same thing. This is regarding the growth of these cells. It also correlated with declining GFR. Okay. So in, in TEMPO trial, probably the GFR decline was lesser, 3 but eight not eight clinically, eight. not statistically significant. Whereas the price trial has shown that there is statistically significant decreased rate of GFR deterioration. Same patient, they are given for a long time, Salvatin, then they have found to be able to But what dose you are using? The maximum, the maximum effect of all the time occurred in first year. After that, it decreased. Yeah. So what is the dose of all the time? So we start with low dose. What dose? What dose and up to what? We can go up to 120 mg 19 by morning and 15 by evening. Mm -hmm. and we started so what were the usual dose used in these trials? So in these trials, they started average. with uh, uh, average was 60. 60. Average was 60. 60 to 19 mg. 19 mg dose. So you start with at least 15 mg once or twice and right. then gradually increase the dose to we achieve the maximally tolerated dose. Then giving one tablet 15 milligram once a day is not a sufficient dose to have an effect. 
What is the problem with this? Yes. Um, so let me uh, yes. increase the say, polyurea apparatus is occurring other than that is the main side effect uh, other than that is liver dysfunction with uh, increase in liver enzymes. Any other? So, back of uh, stabbing and aerobes, um, I've been driving the uh, obturotide, uh, uh, the stereotype. Okay. Anything else? Uh, then, other than that, uh, uh, Krava stabbing was tried, but it did not show any significant effect. And then bocetin. Tyrosine. Tyrosine. I'm sorry, inhibitors. Tyrosine. So there are various methods or medicines which have been tried to retard the progression of these cells, but none of them have stood the test of time except for this. So if you give these patients, for example, and what I'm trying to say. You are trying to block the effect of arginine liver, right? The other way to block this effect is to give them fluid. So if you ask this patient to drink a lot of water, it will have a similar effect. It yes, should have a similar effect. It was poor man, So you, we can ask them, even though the studies have said that we give up to 5 to 6 liters per day, but that has uh, still not proven any evidence. There are studies going on, uh, like hydration trial, I think. But it is still not complete, still and so we give up to three liters to maintain a uh, urine osmolarity of uh, up to 280. But the Canadian Health they go up to 250. You, know. you try to go less than 250, but even then it is difficult to go that go low. So even if you go say 280, 80, and you assume 80. that one, <coughs> the uh, serum osmolality is less than 280, or urine osmolality is less than that, probably there is no ADH or AVP in the system. Right? It has been shown in rats. So but these rats. Mouse. Yeah. So but the similar type of studies are also being done in humans. We are still waiting for the results. Right? So that can be done in these patients. Suppose this gentleman was on your regular follow up and he developed end stage kidney disease. And uh, how you offer the therapies? Suppose he wants to do hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis or uh, renal transplant. Which one is the better? Right. Yeah, which, which modality you can not Renal transplant is always the best modality because uh, it, it has uh, this, its own advantages. But other than that, uh, we can. And how ADPKT patient they do with the renal transplant? They, as their to survival other? is as good as the mm -hmm. other uh, survival. There is no, uh, no, uh, no evidence of uh, poorer survival in these patients. Rather, since there is no recurrence, they might even do better. Then Suppose there is no donor vascular access problem, he wants to opt CAPD. Can he go? He can go ahead with CAPD also, but obviously, since because there will be the, um, um, the surface of the peritoneum that will be provided and uh, that will be low. Anyhow, these patients have higher chances of um, hernias. So, when we add more to it, the chances of hernias increase. Uh, and uh, then, uh, other than that, obviously, the cyst infection, then they can cause it. How cyst infection will get? Mm -hmm. No, no. Suppose the water is clean, I didn't just think what he's saying. No, how suppose this gentleman wants CFED only, there is no option for him. Can CFED how be done make CFED this? better in this patient? Can CFED be done in patients with polycystic kidney disease? It can be done. So the problem when you said there is a high chance of hernia. Hernia and Because there is deep in the abdominal session. Number two? The a space constraint. So if somebody has a very large kidney, there is a space constraint. In that situation, you might have to do a nephrectomy yes, and, and, and then put them you on. Can do the CFPD then. So is there any increased infection in cyst infection because of peritonitis? No. 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 Okay. Number three, what do you say? The peritoneal surface. So where that is the yeah. where, 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 which which peritoneum amounts to the clearance in peritoneal dialysis? Splanchling or peritonitis? Rule of rule of thumb number one kya hai? Inko batao ko, main nanta wala ko doctor ke na nahi to kya karu main? What is rule of thumb? Use your common sense. Jo tumhare dimag mein aaye ki ye sahi hai, usko ulta bolo, wo sahi hai. 
నార్మల్ పేర్ ఐటమ్ పేర్ ఇట్ ఉన్నాయి సార్ బ్యాంకింగ్ పేర్ ఇట్ ఉన్నాయి సార్ సో ఇట్ విల్ నాట్ అఫెక్ట్ ద క్లియరెన్స్ రైట్ ఓన్లీ ప్రాబ్లమ్స్ దీస్ ఆర్ ద టు ప్రాబ్లమ్స్ వన్ ఇస్ ద స్పేస్ అండ్ నంబర్ 2 ఇస్ ద సర్ని అదర్వైస్ పెట్రోనియల్ డయాలసిస్ కెన్ వర్క్ you can do peritoneal dialysis in this way yes. so what happens to the native kidneys in these patients when you do a transplant yes. the post transplant in uh, up to in uh, up to uh, by the three years the this usually uh, decrease in size up to 37% that can be seen post transplant in native kidneys so there, there is generally decrease in the size of native kidneys after kidney transplant why right. so it's very unusual that this patient after 10 years of kidney transplantation now has presented with cyst infection for the first time in life he did not have these problems when he had it was he had a kidney size of 35 cm yeah. but he still has very large kidney who sent what happens to liver cyst in this type of setting and so why the liver cyst size increases but uh, liver cyst size increases post transplanting up to 22% of the patients So what will it will increase in size of the liver liver cyst why why liver size liver cysts are increasing and renal cysts are decreasing mm-hmm. there is mm-hmm. anybody know that and nobody knows the right or wrong but usually it's usually the liver cyst is more in women with hormone related that is a hypothesis for yeah, even hormone related estrogen related but nobody knows the exact cause yeah. how common is malignancy in this case hmm. rcc uh, adpkd does not increase the risk of malignancy in hmm. Hmm. anybody else but if it does occur it what did i just say no common sense don't use your common sense anybody in one percent cases there can be దేవరేషన్ wherever there is increased proliferation there is increased chances of mitogenesis okay so there is increased risk of malignancy in these patients in the long run number 2 it may be bilateral and multifocal at times if you operate upon these patients you may be surprised to find malignancy in fact i would not be surprised to see malignancy in this patient reason being that this patient for the first time has developed infection or some symptoms related to his native kidney now after 10 years of kidney transplant it's quite likely that if you do a nephrectomy yeah, and you yeah, see yeah, yeah. cytology you may find some or maybe many focus of malignancy in this patient right other this gene where, where is this gene located the pkd1 is on chromosome 16 Mm-hmm. and pkd2 was on chromosome 4 arpkd mein kaun hota is it somewhere yeah. close to 6 when to um when i like to tuberous sclerosis is at the same tuberous sclerosis what type of association do these patients have with fibrous 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 so if the, there is a continuous uh, large deletion then the patient will present uh, with early severe uh, uh, so there is a tuberous sclerosis gene involved along with the polycystic kidney gene they may, these patients may develop very uh, early, early polycystic okay. kidney disease so less than 30 years of age with enlarged cyst and renal failure and they will have other manifestations of fibrous sclerosis as well so that's the manifestation what is the natural history of arpkd how you will diagnose arpkd hmm? uh, so arpkd is um, um, it is um, autosomal recessive mainly seen in uh, 
can be diagnosed even in neonatal clinic. The kidneys will be uh, enlarged um, with uh, uh, hyper echoic uh, medulla, uh, and uh, there is loss of differentiation of uh, cortico, uh, cortico medullary uh, junction. Uh, in these patients, there is up to um, uh, 30% perinatal mortality uh, and they also have pulmonary hypophasia, uh, congenital hepatic fibrosis mm -hmm. and yeah. they are born with water faces. Liver involvement is the most serious. More, 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 more severe than, than the kidney involvement. Any other question from anyone? No more? All done? We have discussed. So, now how you will manage hematuria in ADP mm -hmm. cases with normal renal function? It usually settles on the front vein of the with bed rest and IV hydration. This is also the damn stop. But suppose it doesn't settle, then what do we do? Then we will have to look for other <coughs> causes that might be. How will you control the hematuria? Genetic, uh, this uh, huh? genaxamic acid. And um, this can be used if that's the embolization, consistent yes. embolization, embolization, embolization still does not happen in surgical methods. Renal stone disease is a mild. Renal stone disease, uh, like, so, uh, uh, this, uh, so we can go for uh, lithotripsy or laser fragmentation, like normal. Lithotripsy, laser fragmentation, yeah. laser fragmentation, yeah. Laser fragmentation yeah. Yeah. Uh, flexible urethro. Okay. Uretroscopy, as per the patient, yeah. stone location you will manage. So depending on where is the stone, what is the what no. is stone causing? If the stone is causing uretric obstruction, you have to manage like any other uretric yeah. obstruction. Right? So but the management will be just like any any other thing. Yeah. How you fo follow a patient of anabrazin? How, what is the line of her image? Cerebral anabrazine is the common thing, right? Like arterial perforation. Uh, Which patient do you will follow more seriously? Those who had a pre, uh, strong family history yes. of uh, intracranial aneurysm, those who themselves have a personal history of subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, mm -hmm. in the past, uh, those patients uh, who have, are at high risk occupation, or those who are undergoing a major surgery. Uh, other than that, those who are very anxious to find out, they can go ahead. At what uh, size of aneurysm you will offer the treatment? More than 10, uh, that is definitive uh, for surgery. 10? Centimeter? Centimeter, centimeter or <laughs> millimeter? Millimeter. Huh? Millimeter. 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 Yes. Tell me, good. Okay. You did very well. Okay. Shanti, you have found? Yes, I have found. Another one. Final year? Or second year? Final year. No, that was very good. Very good. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, thank you everyone.